Hi, guys, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and today I am here with Sherilyn Decker, who is a writer, speaker, and a Christian life coach committed to transforming your storms of life into strength and purpose. I just love that. Thank you, Sher Sherilyn, for being here with us. Oh, I'm glad to be here, Jamie. It is so nice to meet you, and I am just honored to be a part of you know, this conversation today. Well, before we dig into our conversation, I, uh, we always ask our guests one question, which is, what is your favorite prayer closet? Where do you go to feel close to God? Yeah, so I keep a pretty constant dialogue with God during the day, wherever I am, but I find that the times when I can be the most vulnerable with God, when I can let the tears flow and it really doesn't matter, is in the shower. All right, there you have it. <laughs> I agree with you. I think, uh, and especially, and you're a mom, uh -huh. and I think as moms, I don't know, how old are your kids? 13 and 11. Okay. So they're older now. They're not constantly at your heels, but still, I know as a mom, just being in the shower, it's, it's an escape. Um, even the bathroom, sometimes you got mm -hmm. kids banging on the doors, even at, when they're older, but the shower, nobody's going to come in there, right? <laughs> no, there's like this respect we have for us standing there in our nakedness. And I think to be able to stand there with God yeah. and be comfortable in our vulnerabilities mm -hmm. with everything just out there. He knows it all anyway. So why not take advantage of that time yeah. to kind of be like, hey, God, let's have a conversation here. Well, and don't you feel like it's one of the few times that there's no input with the world that we live in right now? Because you're just, I mean, you could have input if you have music. Like we have, one of our bathrooms has Bluetooth speakers, so you can hook up your music. Um, sometimes in the shower, I'll listen to podcasts or messages, but there's just certain times that I just want to be no input and just other than just being with God. And even if there's nothing to say, sometimes that's when your thoughts can be receptive and shaped. And uh, yeah, I like, I mm -hmm. also look to the shower as one of, one of my favorite prayer closets. Um, but I'm like you, I, um, I know my co-host Alana is great with the marathon prayers where she just, you know, gets in her room or her office and she just, you know, settles in for long times of prayer. That is not my strong suit, but just kind of carrying God with me and throwing up prayers everywhere. That's kind of where, where I find, you know, that I, I do kind of carry my prayer closet around sometimes. I don't, I feel pretty comfortable praying in my mind anywhere. The car is another one for me because I feel like, you know, for all people know, you're talking on the phone to someone and you can talk out loud. I like being able to talk out loud to God sometimes. Yeah. And they're definitely seasoned when I am a, you know, teeth in the carpet kind of girl and I'm like yeah. crying out and I have those long prayers where I'm really kind of going after God's, God's presence and God's face and God's decision and some things. But for the most, most of the time on a routine basis, outside of me reading my Bible, my prayer closet is in the shower. And sometimes maybe it's, it's like teeth in the, in the bottom of the shower, right? <laughs> I've, I've actually knelt and prayed in the shower before. You can do that. I guess a little bit, a little bit different. Anyway, moving right along. Another, another question for you though, it's kind of a lighthearted question before we move on. Um, are you a tea or a coffee person? I am a tea <laughs> drinker. All right. I really am. I, I appreciate the smell of coffee. My daughter can make some pretty fantastic concoctions and I'll taste them, but they're just not for me. I'm a tea girl. I like black tea. So I'm not like, don't waste. I'm not, I'm not gonna waste my time with the green stuff. Right. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> do you drink your black tea black or do you like to put cream and sugar in it? Stevia. Stevia. Very good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. One All pack right. per cup. <laughs> All right. Now that we're past those important <laughs> questions. Um, yeah. So you, you're a life coach, you're a speaker, and I love the tagline on your website mm -hmm. where it says transforming your storms of life into strength and purpose. So yeah. I want to know how did this become your goal? I know it stems from a very personal place, but I don't know the whole story. So could you tell us what storms in your life have equipped you to be this person for other women? Yeah. I would say it's more than just one storm. Mm -hmm. It's been a season of them. It's probably been about 12 years of storms. 
and going through them in a various shape or form from, you know, um, not getting the job that I wanted to being passed over for promotions. Those are sometimes some small ones. Um, I had a very rough pregnancy. Um, and then we had some devastations in my family when we lost my dad to cancer. Mm -hmm. And that was just, it was just touched me in this raw place. And after that, I mean, and God had been working on me in a series of me being dissatisfied in my job. And that led me to, to leave. And I went to go work for a startup. And I'll never forget the phone call on a very cold day, the last Friday in February. And my boss called to tell me my position was eliminated. And it was that particular storm, which was the catalyst to changing and transforming my entire life. Hmm. I sat there in my office at home because I was a consultant, I was working from home and I collapsed in my chair with mascara streaking down my face. And I was asking those questions that just form in those moments. Will we get through this? How will we get through this? How do I know it's going to be okay? And that's when the faith really meets the circumstances. Do I trust you, God? Do you really have me in the palm of your hand? And my, you know, it's, we lost 60% of our income in that one call. Mm-hmm. And so my life, everything I knew about myself was attached to my work. So my identity took a big, huge hit. And it was often where I sat there and I was just like, okay, it was my life and my finances that took a hot, that was, became a hot mess. And I was completely shattered. I was frozen in fear. I lost my confidence in myself. I lost my ability to really function for a little while. And it was that. That was the catalytic moment, that storm that hit. We really had to be like, okay, God, who are you? And he, you know, I know in my head, I taught, and I was a financial coach at church. I knew all about the stuff. I knew all the verses about God being my provider. Mm -hmm. But until you have to see him show up in that way, you don't really know the I am your provider piece of his identity until you are calling on him for it. Oh yeah. Well, it's like we kind of keep that part of God in our pocket. Like, yeah, yeah. He's the provider. And as we walk Mm -hmm. along making our own way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what I want to know what your prayer life looked like during that time, because I'm imagining you're, you know, active in your church. You probably have normal prayer life going along. And then Mm -hmm. what happened? How did that impact you in your spiritual life? You're right. I'm a Jesus girl. I've been in the church since I was in the womb. Um, I thought I knew how to pray. Mm -hmm. I thought I knew who God was, but it wasn't until I was in that moment that I had to connect with him in a different way because the prayers that I was praying before did not work. Mm -hmm. And I had to really dive in and be like, okay, God, what are you, I need you to teach me how to pray. I need you to teach me how to get through this. And he began to highlight scripture to me. I would read in my daily reading and something would jump out to me, a promise from God. And I would latch onto that and I would repeat it over and over and over. Mm -hmm. I would have sticky notes all of my house. What would remind me of that verse? Because he said he was my provider. He said that he saw this coming. He says that he has me equipped for everything that he's called me to do. Yet here I am in this place where I've lost my job. And I had to really lean on him for that. And I really had, to, and because you know what happens when something, when one storm comes, usually another one and another one and another one. And in that season of us losing 60% of our income, other things began to break. Mm. Doctor's appointments needed to be had with, you know, bills that we didn't expect new roof on the house, like all kinds of big expensive items begin to happen when you're in this place of God, do I trust you? So sometimes it's not just one little storm. 
it's a series of tornadoes, one after another. And we really have to kind of say, okay, God, I need to know how to pray. And so that for me is I really had to understand how he wanted me to respond. And in that is finding out what he says about me. Because there was so much about me that was broken. Mm. There was so much about me that I didn't know. There was so much about him that I didn't know. And until I knew what he said about me, what he said about himself, and what he said about my circumstances, then my prayers didn't work. But when I knew those things, then I could hold on to them and latch on to them like, you know, like a dog that doesn't let go of a rope, right? When you're playing tug of war. Yeah. If, if I could hold on to that that tight, then I knew that I could get through because his word was true and I got to test it for myself. That is so powerful. And I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you're talking about the prayers I was praying before weren't working. And it makes me think that when we're in this season of contentment and autopilot and things going okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, those are seasons that God gives us and that's okay. But I personally feel sometimes the need to, and I don't think it's a conscious thing, but what you said made me think of it, to pray prayers that I know God will answer or has already answered. It's like, I'm almost protecting God in my mind. Like, you know, I'm almost afraid to ask the prayers that are beyond what would happen anyway. And that's dangerous because then you become God, you know, or mm. fate becomes God or circumstance and, um, or even luck, you know? And so, and, and that's dangerous. And I think it's these sacred times that are painful where we go to God and say, like you just, just like you said, teach me how to pray that we really tap in to that relationship. And again, not to say that we can't experience those kinds of breakthrough prayers and, and relationship with God when we're going through good times too, if we're seeking him. But I think the catalyst to seek him, like there's no better catalyst to seek him than crisis. Mm -hmm. And so that's a challenge for me because, you know, right now there are some challenges, but life is pretty much okay right now. I mean, I'm, I'm in kind of like on, on an up season and I just realized that there are times where I just, I'm, I'm just praying almost as kind of a cherry on top of what life is already like. And that's not what God wants in any season. He wants us to always be digging deep and always be making that white space of like, God, I need to hear you desperately. So yeah, that's good. I'm, I, I love that. Um, so you get to this place and you're, you're asking God to teach you how to pray. You're, you know, posting these things on walls. One thing that I love about what I saw on your website and just what you, what you're all about is this idea of speaking God's truth over ourselves. And I think declaring God's truth, whether it's affirmations or just reciting scripture straight from the Bible, what role would you say that those, that that type of prayer plays in going from just being paralyzed by this storm, which is where we are in our own flesh is just stuck to like launching forward. Mm. The biggest role is stepping into our authority because you are the bride of Christ. You are the child of the most high King. Just sit and let that wash over you for a minute. Oh, yeah. Who messes with the child of God? Who, who could actually mess with the child of God? If you're a princess, if you're an heir to the kingdom, no one messes with you. Hmm. The word says that God will crush Satan under our feet yet we let him pester us. And when we declare the scripture, we are praying the way Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's already in heaven. He's sitting there. He has a will, a purpose, a plan for us. That's, by the way, more than we can ask, think, or imagine. And I can ask for some pretty big stuff. I can think pretty big. And I can imagine some pretty big stuff. And he has more. And so when we're declaring scripture, we're praying, we're bringing God's thoughts about us and our circumstances into the earth. We're pulling it down. God, what do you feel about this? What do you think about this? What's your heart about this? 
And so in practice, that looks like Jesus in the boat with his disciples. When the storm is raging and that's happening in our life and the storm is raging and a virus is all over the world and he's napping <laughs> and his scared, fearful disciples wake him up and they're like, Jesus, get a bucket and help me bail this water out of the boat. And what does he do? He stands up and he declares for the, out of his creative power of his word to speak life or death. And he tells the wind and the waves to knock it off. When my kids are arguing and I tell them to knock it off, we speak with that authority that's like, oh, mama ain't happy. Well, same thing when someone's trying to mess with a child of God and we know that our king, that our father that loves us so much has the authority and he's given it to us and he says, I put the enemy under your feet. We can take that authority and we can use it. And so I want to encourage you when we know what God's will is in a situation, what he says, what he promises, speaking that declaration is speaking on his authority because he's given it to us. That's, so that's good. the role that it plays. Yeah, everything. And, you know, it's, it, it brings to mind kind of a silly image, but the kids and I watched um, the new Aladdin that's like the live action Aladdin. And, you know, the princess is disguised and I'm going to get the story wrong, but the idea of it is she like takes something to give to a child, like a piece of bread or an apple or something. And the, the, the owner of the cart is like, you, you thief, don't take that. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's revealed that she's who she is and everyone just bows down and, and it's like, oh wait, that's yours anyway. And I feel like that's who we are. And but when we're choosing not to walk in that authority, because Satan would love for us to have amnesia and forget whose we are, and to walk as, as, as one of the common people, you know, and, and to walk around being rebuked by Satan, you know, and, and being told what we can't take and what we can't have or what's not our birthright. And if we choose not to walk in it, if we choose not to take that cloak off and reveal who we are, then we're stuck. Then it's true. We, we can't take those things. We will be hauled off to jail for stealing, you know? And I'm, anyway, let's mm -hmm. not take that analogy too far, but, right. but the bottom line is that's so true that when we're, that, that we can be deceived, we can forget even as Christians, even if you've gone to church your whole life and you've been committed to Christ for many, many, many years, there are still these times when that veil of deception keeps us from acknowledging who we are. And I think these scriptures, reminders, like we have to cling to those. I think that is so powerful. Yeah. And let's take that a little bit further. Paul says, lay aside every hindrance. If that hindrance is me, then I want to know what I need to take off so I can put on everything that God has given me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's this picture that's coming to mind, and it's like a birthday party. My daughter just turned 13, and we had all these presents, right? And God has all these presents for you. And if we think, oh, that's a beautiful pink bag with a cute little tissue paper. I want to open that one. And we open all the presents, but there's one in the back that we don't open. The giver is like, why didn't she open my present? So here God has something for you in a gift bag with beautiful tissue paper and nice bow. It's got glitter on it and, you know, all kinds of beautiful stuff on the outside. And what's inside is this treasure that he's just desiring you to open, yet you leave it there. That doesn't, I mean, in a birthday party, we'd be like, you forgot one. Well, I want to tell you, you forgot one. Mm. There's a promise in the Bible that you're not declaring. Let's figure out what that is so you can stand in the fullness of everything God paid for. Amen. Yeah. And to think of it that way, you know, if God's the giver, just imagine how much it grieves him for that present to be sitting there, you know, <laughs> mm. unopened. Yeah. Why do you think as women, do you, well, first of all, do you think it's hard for us as women to claim some of those promises? And why do you think that is? What, I do. What might, be, what might stand in our way? I do think way? it's hard for us. I have one client who felt this way. And when we were coaching and talking through the root of some of this, what was at the inside is that she didn't think she was valuable enough. 
she didn't feel like she was valuable enough for those truths, for those truths, those promises. Yet, if she was the only one on earth, Jesus would have still died for her. I want you to receive all Jesus died for, all of his promises. His promises are yes and amen. They aren't for someone else. They are for you. They're for you. You don't waste anything. He wants you to have it. He's giving it to you. It's a gift. It's for you. And so what to, to think it's hard to claim those truths and promises makes me wonder, do you really think you're valuable enough? Because you are. He spent the cost of his son for you. Yeah, that truth, I think, is the foundation of all the, all the others. You deserve God's blessings. You mm -hmm. have not earned it, but you deserve it because of what Jesus did on the cross. And you're worthy now. And, I, you know, I think that's, that has to be the foundational truth. And so if anyone is out there not feeling valuable, go back to the gospel. You know, have someone explain exactly what that means. The fact that we are sinners, every last one of us. And while we were still sinners, Jesus died to take that penalty of sin on himself and that it's not something that can be earned. It's not something that you can strive for and get like the approval from people that we have been conditioned to receive. Or, you know, as a, as a people pleaser, I know you on, on your website, you talk about <laughs> your recovering people pleaser and I, I am. And it's so difficult for those of us that are people pleasers by nature to accept that without anything changing, that at our very worst, that we are worthy and mm -hmm. that it's not selfish. That's the other thing I think we struggle with, that I struggle with is declaring good things over myself isn't selfish. It's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of my energy because I'm thinking, well, I should be praying for someone else or, well, I, I need to do this or do that. And, and you, you begin to neglect your spiritual self-care. And I think that's also a big hindrance um, from living a fulfilled life and a life that's connected to God. That's the key, a filled life. You can't pour from an empty cup. Mm -hmm. We can't pray for others when we won't let God touch us first. Yeah. On the other side of that coin is this idea of, of, false confidence. So can you talk about that a little bit? What would, what does that look like? Cause I know that you've lived that side of it before you got to this breakthrough moment. So can you talk about that? What did that look like in your life? And what was the turning point for you? When I was in corporate America, I was very successful. I was really good at what I did. That was in my own strength using the gifts that God had just naturally given me, right? Mm -hmm. My, and there's nothing wrong with that, being good at the things that he's given you as your strengths. Yet even in that something I was really good at, there was a confidence in me that wasn't real. Mm -hmm. And I say that because it was on a weak foundation, places that were in my heart where God wanted to do work, but my ego got in the way. And now I learned how to tap into God's strength through that because he called me out of a place that I wasn't good at. So I could see and I could lean on him in the places of my weakness. Yeah. And what does that look like in, in mm -hmm. practice? What are the steps that you take to get to that place? Yeah. So I can't help women turn trials into triumph without God. He uses me to do the work, but I can't do it in and of myself. I can't bring women into my programs, into my courses. God does that. I can't sell anything. I can do all the stuff that all the business people, all the gurus tell me to do, yet God will put a ceiling mm -hmm. on my efforts until I am ready to do it in his strength. He uses the trials of my life, even the financial business ones, 
all of the trials in our life, he uses those as a place to form our character. So in that process, he shows us, he showed me where I was not strong in him so that I could let go of my own strength and hold on to his. So some practical steps of what that looks like for me is when I'm working with clients, we'll, I'll often give the analogy of potholes. When we're first learning how to drive, our driver's education teacher, whether it's our parents or it's a classroom environment, will talk to us about potholes because we don't want to hit them. It'll damage the car, flatten the tires. So we learn not to hit them. But how often have we done so? So when, we, when I help clients find those places, find those obstacles that are in their life that they've hit before, then we can recognize those lessons so that we don't repeat them. It's so we don't get in the same cycle. So sometimes that looks like um, people who push our buttons. There's this great scene in the movie Elf. It's by my far, by fa one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. And he's standing in the elevator. And he's so excited to go see his dad and meet his dad that he pushes every button in the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> he lights up the whole panel, right? Can you see it in your mind? Yes. And he's standing there. And there's this guy who's like, I now have to go to every single floor in the elevator. And he stands there. But he doesn't say a word. Somewhere along the line that guy's buttons weren't, you know, don't work anymore. So it doesn't matter what life had thrown at him. Elf could push all the buttons and do it intentionally on purpose. And that guy stood there reactionless. Mm. So if we can get to the place where we can go through places where God is asking us to trust him with something, trust us in a place of our weakness, trust us in a place of our anger, trust us in a place of our people pleasing, whatever those obstacles for each of us might be, for me, it was confidence. For me, it was people pleasing and a couple other things. If we can trust God with those buttons that push, you know, that when they're pushed on us, they're woundings. If we can trust him with that and let him heal those and strengthen those and transform those, then they won't work. And that means that when the next time somebody comes along to try to push our buttons or to try to throw an obstacle in our way, we'll see it coming and we'll know exactly what to do to get around it. I love that. And, you know, that is contrary, I think, to a lot of the world's wisdom. The world would say, if someone is pushing your buttons, it's their problem. And sure, they've got a problem. But what God says is, I can, you know, I, that, that I can give you what you need to love your enemies. I can give you what you need to live peaceably. Um, not that there isn't a time for boundaries. I absolutely mm -hmm. believe that there's a time where we need to set healthy boundaries with toxic people, but yep. we're talking about the day to day. And I feel like if you find yourself looking around and thinking, I am surrounded by idiots, <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe it's time to ask God to work in, in, like you said, that strengthening so that our buttons aren't so easily pushed. Um, or for me, woundedness is something that I struggle with. And it's in my marriage. It's in my relationships. I love to play the victim. I love to be the martyr. I hate it, but I, but I love it at the same time. And so God is working on me and in me. To st I, I've never seen it this way, but I'll never watch Elf without, <laughs> and we watch it every year, without <laughs> thinking about that and, and just smiling at, okay, yeah, God is going to help me strengthen my buttons so that they can push away and it's not going to wound me. You know, it's going to be mm -hmm. healing. And that is, that's really powerful because when we shift that focus, we can have victory. We don't have to be a victim. We don't have to be paralyzed in situations and feel helpless. We, we begin to be powerful people that can just walk confidently through life confident in who we are and, and, and have this audience of one that is, cause ultimately I think it comes from wanting approval and to please people, but we, we have this audience of one. And as long as he's pleased, as long as I'm following his directions, then, then I don't need to worry about the other things that come at me. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's And good. we can learn to use those things that come at us as an opportunity for God to teach us something. Mm. And that comes through in the most practical ways. When, when this whole coronavirus first thing happened, you know, I live in Colorado. We, we only just now have a mask mandate. And so when I was walking through Costco, because I had to wear one at Costco, and in the very beginning, and 
it just was driving me nuts. It kept falling off my face. It kept, you know, I was just visibly irritated by the whole thing. And I just couldn't figure out why I couldn't keep it on my nose. It was like a bandaid, cute little bandaid I had around my face. And I was like, God, what is the deal? And he was just like, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and he's like, do you, he goes, are you paying attention? And so he used that opportunity to get me to be aware of what's happening. And I could see fear on people. Oh. And so then at that moment, I was like, okay, I see fear. My visible frustration with this mask isn't helping anything. And what do you want me to do? And he's like, I want you to, you know, to walk through Costco and I want you to release these people from fear. Now he didn't have me touch anybody or pray for anybody or lay hands on anybody. He just had me walk through and release peace and release you know, God's presence in that place just by walking up and down the aisles. Every time I saw somebody with a mask on who I sensed any fear in. So when we know, when we can use these opportunities as, as a place, like, Hey, this is not my normal. This is not my normal. If this is not my normal and I'm irritated by something, I can bring that irritation to the Lord and say, take the speck out of my eye. What's here? (laughs) What is here that doesn't belong here? Yes, you know, this whole thing is wrong and I shouldn't have to do this, blah, 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 blah. I can get it all into my, you know, soapbox and high horse about the whole thing. But at the end of the day, it's God. How can you refine me in this and give him an opportunity to to use the smallest little things as lessons? And then we walk through life equipped and empowered. And I'll tell you what, when you do that, then at the end the end of the shopping trip at Costco, people look at you and be like, this thing doesn't bother you, does it? I'm like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Wow. That is so powerful. Just that idea of using the irritations, even the small ones or the big ones, but, but that, you know, what is it? I think it was, was it CS Lewis that said pain is God's megaphone? Somebody said that and you guys can Google that and figure it out. But, um, but, any irritation could be God prompting you to come to him. And I love that example that you gave. I had a Costco experience early on in, in the COVID crisis that didn't turn out as great in my heart until later. I did not listen in Costco to God, but um, I was walking through and shopping for the family and we had not been out. We had some pretty early restrictions put in place. And uh, there was an elderly couple walking through Costco and neither of them had masks on and, and the woman was hacking and coughing. I mean, just all over the place. And immediately kind of fear rose up in me and I'm thinking, she's contaminating this whole place. Why is she not wearing a mask? What is wrong with them? Why didn't he leave her at home? And I mean, I, my mama bear instinct of, you know, I'm shopping for my kids. I don't want to bring a virus home. And it wasn't until I got home and reflected on why I was so irritated because it that feeling that rose up in me. I carried it. It was the chip on my shoulder. I carried it out of there. No one was blessed by me, I'm sure. And, um, but I got home and I started thinking about it and God started working on me then. And, and basically, like you said, it was that prompting of you're not even seeing this person as a human. You're seeing her as an irritation. Look at her as a human. Look deeper. Look at the man that was with her. And all of these possibilities started flooding my mind. Maybe he couldn't leave her at home. Maybe she was confused. Maybe she couldn't wear a mask because she would mess with it too much or who knows. But at the very least, pray for this woman's cough, you know? (laughs) I mean, pray that she would be healed. And so it's amazing what happens when we stop and just allow God to check our spirits. And I just confess, I, I don't do it enough, but I just, I, I love that idea. It's almost a joy now to think forward of, okay, I'm going to look forward to this next time that I get irritated so I can go to God and let him show me something new or point me in a, in a positive direction. Cause that is like, you know, sticking it to the enemy right there. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. You're going to have to message me after that. I'll let you know. I'm going to let everybody know (laughs) without naming names the next time I'm irritated. (laughs) (laughs) 
So I also want to talk with you a little bit about, um, about prayer and this idea. So I, I was listening to another podcast you were on, and I, I loved the conversation. And you talked a lot about pruning and stripping and this process that God has taken you through as being just a really important part of what God does in our lives. And in terms of prayer, I think we think of prayer a lot of times as, you know, opening our hands to receive God's blessing and, and, you know, God is the cosmic Santa, you know, give me this, give me that, help me with this, help me with that, help this person and that person. What do you think about prayer? Do you think it's important to open our prayer lives to God to invite him to prune us? Or is that something that just happens? What is, what do you think our role is in the pruning process? Do you think we have to be Mm. proactive about it? Or do you think that we just need to be open to it and receptive? Yeah, that is a great question, Jamie. I love God's abundance too. And sometimes we can't hold God's abundance until we let go of what is in our hands. Oh, that's good. Until we get out (laughs) of our own way so we can actually receive There was this season of my life when this whole, um, after losing my job, being in this place where I had tight, a tight fist around a lot of things in my life, a lot of positions, a lot of pieces of my identity. Let's, I'm just going to call it identity because that's what it was. And little bit by little bit, I had so tightly gripped onto that. Like I will never not let, you know, I will never let go. And little by little, God pried every single one of my white knuckled, tightly gripped fist. He pried every finger open because I wasn't letting go. So yeah, you can not do it and it will be a painful process. I've, I don't know which podcast you listen to, but that process for me was ugly. That part was painful. It was probably the the most part of, I don't like you, God, that was the real part of my rawness with the Lord. Mm. And then there were times in my life where I have a posture of surrender, where I'm like, Lord, this isn't mine. You have stewarded this to me. You have given this to me. I'm giving it back. And if you want me to have it, because this is right for this season, I trust that you'll put it in my hands. And being a constant place of knowing whatever he prunes is because he wants to make sure that there's life and fruit in the places where he wants it. And it's not diverting energy into the people and the places and the things that he doesn't want me in this season. Some really painful relationships were pruned off. And sometimes when we see relationships pruned off, friendships that come to an end um, for no apparent reason, or, or maybe there was a reason and you, you know, but God was in that. And he's just like, I want to prune you because where you're going, they can't go because they have their own call. They have their own journey that they're on. And you guys were along this parallel path for a little while, and now you have to diverge. And so sometimes even in the normal course of walking along life with one another, Jamie, my path would have never met you had I still continued to follow this person down theirs. Mm-hmm. So it's about pruning and surrendering and saying, God, I trust you with the purposes and plans that you have for me to know that there are some things that I can't have right now. There's this interesting story in the Bible, and and, and I'm lost as to where it is, but you guys can go on Bible Gateway and find it. And he's talking about how... um, In the end of the evening, when they would close up the city, and if anybody was coming in from out of town, they would have to enter through a very narrow gate. And in order to do that, the camel and the rider, the rider had to get off the camel, and they had to take everything off in order to get through the narrow gate. And the camel had to cross through on its knees. And so I'm in the season of my life where I'm surrendering. I'm taking everything off, every hindrance, everything that God has given me, everything that God wants to take from me. And I'm like, Lord, I'm just going to take it all off because there's a door, there's a place you want me to go that I can't get through unless I'm ready and willing to get off the saddle, pull everything off and say, okay, what's coming with me? And we can see our lives as saying, what baggage 
Do I leave at the cross? That's the easy part of surrender. What baggage, what bad part of my life, what stuff do I need forgiven for that I can leave at the foot of the cross? And then there's the stuff that says, but this was a, this was a good thing, God. These friendships were good. This church you had me attending was wonderful. It was feeding me. And he's like, that's not where I want you right now. And so there, I was a worship leader. He had me step down from worship ministry. This was something that I was gifted at. I was operating inside of my calling yeah. and I had to let go so he could prune and gift me in a completely different way. And so sometimes surrender is painful because we're holding on to things that we can't take into the next season. And sometimes they're inhibiting us from growth that God wants us to have. And so I don't want you to think of surrender as always negative because the master gardener makes amazing flowers. That is so true. And I, I love that visual of the camel going through that gate, the eye of the needle, right? Isn't that the gate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love that picture. So I am not a great gardener. We had the couple of owners before us, the, the woman that lived there at our house was an amazing gardener. And I just really hope she never drives by our house, but there are some rose bushes and they are beautiful. They have these beautiful, like really, really strong smelling roses. They're kind of smaller sized roses, but they're beautiful. They smell nice. And I had neglected them for many years and they had gotten to the point where they were actually so spindly that they were growing up like through the evergreen trees and they were growing out so much that when we'd pull our trailer around, we have a camper, um, when we brought it to the house, it would like scrape against everything. So I tried to cut them back a few times, but finally this last year, I had the courage to cut them all the way back. And I think probably anyone that gardens is probably just thinking, of course you did. That's what you do with roses. But I was scared to death because I thought I would kill them. And honestly, and the other thing is there were some beautiful stems with beautiful full you know uh branches of roses there were also some that looked like they were dying like there was something wrong with them so i just i hacked them to the ground you know just be you know six or eight inches whatever a foot and um i was terrified they looked dead and when spring came they still looked dead and i was convinced i had killed all of the roses but they came back with a vengeance and I don't have as many roses this year because I, from what I've heard, they, they bloom off of last year's, uh, whatever greenery. Um, but I have some, some roses, but the, the plants are beautiful and gorgeous. And so now I'm able to maintain them. And I just think there was, I was so afraid of cutting off what was good because there was some good stuff there. There were, I had lots of roses and I had to cut off the good and the bad and, and get it down to a place where it could start so that it had a future. And, and I might not see those roses this season, but next season they're going to be gorgeous. They're going to be beautiful. So I just think of that as that picture that you give of sometimes the pruning, it's not always just the bad stuff. And that's important to remember too. And that when that pruning happens, not to be surprised by it, because my tendency is to think, okay, God, this is a good thing. I've had ministry too, where I've been operating in this ministry. And I think, of course, God wants me to do this. And then he calls me away. And I just think, why? I mean, that doesn't make sense in my limited knowledge, but not to be afraid of even holding those, the good things with open hands to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we fight surrender, it delays our breakthrough. Mm. And so sometimes when we have to let go of some really good stuff, if God is asking you for it, it's because he has something better, something different, something he's taking you somewhere. There's this beautiful picture. I'm sure most of you have seen it on the, on Facebook where there's this, you know, Jesus and he's crouched down with this little girl and he's asking her for her teddy bear. Yeah. Have you seen it? Uh, yeah, and then and she's like, but Jesus, I don't want to give it to you. And but behind his back is this enormous teddy bear. Yeah. But she doesn't know because she has to let go of something she loves so much. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, God prunes off the dead stuff that, you know, isn't producing fruit anymore. And sometimes he's pruning the stuff that has beautiful roses on it. And you don't understand, but you have to trust that you, you know, that he, the vine dresser. Yeah. Because he knows he's not just the gardener, he he's the master gardener. And, yeah. you know, he knows way more than we do. He thankfully. does. <laughs> well, I think right now, probably more than any other time I can think of, I can pretty much guarantee that everyone listening is going through some kind of struggle or storm right now. 
maybe more so than, than other times in their lives. So what is one piece of advice that you would leave someone with who feels stuck and paralyzed by what they're going through and just unable to get out of that rut? What's step mm-hmm. one? Step one is to find a promise from God on what's going on in your life right now and begin speaking it out loud. And if you don't know where to start, I have five powerful prayer declarations that will speak the word of God over those situations in your life. The top five areas are finances, family, work, health, and future. I think I I listed all five, but I, you know, I'm glad to give those to you if you don't know where to start. If you don't know where to start in the word of God to find a promise for what's going on to hold on to, then I'll give you that. Because when we know what God says about our circumstances and we declare those things out loud, Mm -hmm. it brings God's authority over our circumstances and our circumstances begin to change. Where can they find those? How can they get a hold of those? Thank you so much for making those available too. Oh, you are welcome. Glad to do that. So um, you can get those on my website and I will make sure there's a special page for for you, Jamie. So it will be my website, SherilynDecker.com forward slash praying women will be the page for you guys to go to, to get um, those five declarations. And there'll be a couple other um, ways to access me on there as well. My links to my Facebook page and my Instagram and, and those types of connections will all be in that one spot on that website, um, my website, SherilynDecker.com forward slash praying women. All right. That is perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, how can our listeners find you? Well, we know where to find you online. What about social media? What what are your social media places that you hang out? So my Facebook page is Coach Sherilyn. Um, That's where I produce a Wednesday word drop. And so every Wednesday I take a scripture from the Lord that he has given me for that week or that month, this month we're talking about peace and I flip it into a declaration. I find a promise from God and I stand on that. And so every Wednesday I do a word drop um, and that's 10 o'clock mountain time, noon Eastern. Um, That's done live. That's completely free content. And so that's my Facebook page. I am on Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn. And those um, handles are my name, Cheryl and Decker. Okay. And that's C-H-E-R-L-Y-N. Yes. Decker. All right. Yes. Perfect. Well, how can we pray for you today? I am entering into a sabbatical season. This is an intentional period of rest. Um, I don't know how long it's going to be. I don't know what I'm permitted to do during that time because when God calls us into a place of rest, sometimes rest is play. And sometimes rest is, you know, spend more time in the word. And sometimes rest is, okay, only do these things that I call you to do. It was really interesting. I was selling some furniture on Facebook Marketplace. And I was in the process of, um, I'm getting some licenses renewed. And I was reading my homework materials. And then right in the middle of like chapter six of my book, I just feel the nudge from the Lord that I need to go move my cars and get this piece of furniture that's in my garage ready for these people to come. Now, if I had ignored that nudge, I would have missed the window because when these people came, as soon as I finished, right, I would have, they would have rang the doorbell and I would have had to do all of that. Instead, I was ready because the Lord had whispered, this is what he wanted me to do next, right in the middle of my reading, you know, my homework. And so I want to be intentional with what God is calling me to do in this season. And so just this morning, I was declaring Isaiah 30, 21, that, you know, he will, I will hear a voice telling me this is the way to walk in it. And so I'm seeking God for in this season of intentional sabbatical and rest for clarity and direction in some decisions and which way to walk so that you can join me in declaring that over me um, and praying that over me that, you know, cause I stand on his promises. He says he will guide mm-hmm. me. He says he will direct me. He says he'll be the voice behind me. He will. And sometimes that requires an intentional listening and so sometimes nice. it's not immediately. God is not, you know, a genie in a bottle. He's not going to pop out every single time that, you know, we think he will. Sometimes he shows up in a whisper and sometimes he's as loud as the thunder that just went off outside my window. So (laughs) sorry if you heard that, (laughs) but so I think that's how you can, you can pray for me is to be intentional in this season of sabbatical and really lean in on what God's going to do. We'll definitely do that. And that has to be hard though, because I know just acknowledging the need for rest is hard. 
actually stopping and taking a sabbatical, that's hard. So we will definitely be praying for you to have perseverance in that. It doesn't seem like it should be, but everyone listening knows rest is hard. It is hard. I'm a get it done type of girl. I'm a Lord, I've got goals. I have my quarterly plan. I have what I want to get done this year, things that he had birthed. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and you want me to stop? What? What, what, what's this? But I've been resisting. I've been in a season where I'm burning the candles at both ends and I feel mm-hmm. it. And I know, and as all my best friends like, Sherilyn, maybe he's calling you to rest. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but Why does he have again, to tell me through you too? <laughs> right. Again, that's confirmation in yeah. the surrender of trusting God mm-hmm. with all of the other stuff that if it doesn't need to get done, it's because it doesn't need to get done. And right now I don't need it. Um, and so, you know, I was just preaching to myself this whole entire time. We've been talking about surrender and pruning because he's asking me to let go and let him keep everything else running, keep serving everyone else, keep loving everyone else, keep meeting everyone else's needs so he can meet mine. Cause I can't, I can't, I don't know what he's doing next. And he does. Yep. So you're going to go move that car <laughs> and wait for the people to show up, you know, I mean, that's good. All right. Well, Sherilyn, thank you. This has been a pleasure. Loved meeting you. And I'm so excited to get this message out to, to our listeners because I know it's something that is going to really bless a lot of women. So thanks for joining us. Oh, so glad to be here. Thank you, Jamie, for this wonderful opportunity. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we just come before you grateful that you know more than we do, that you are sovereign that you see, you don't even see the future. You are, you're in the future already. You've gone before us. You've, you're paving the path. You're making the way for us. And we thank you for that, God. And we claim that for Sherilyn as she steps out in faith to take this sabbatical, just totally stepping out into the unknown to her, but trusting that it's not unknown, that it's not a surprise to you. And just like she took that step of faith and moved that car, God, I just, I pray that you would meet her in her obedience in a powerful way. I pray that at the moments when she is questioning whether she heard right, or she's questioning whether she should continue to rest or just go back to to business as usual or tempted to make exceptions, that you would meet her with just um, confirmation of your calling for this time of rest, that you would give her a glimpse of what you're doing, just a glimpse so that she can just keep walking forward in obedience and faith. God, we do declare over her that you have plans for her, that your voice can be heard above all of the noise and will be, that she will recognize the voice of the shepherd, that all of the other voices swirling around all the chaos will totally be shut down because you are powerful, because you speak to your sheep and they will hear your voice and they will know you. We declare that over her, God, in Jesus' name, that she will hear you, that she will hear next steps, that she will know when it's time to rest. She will know when that restriction is lifted and when it's time to work and to move forward and time to go about business. In the meantime, we pray for contentment and peace. We pray against a spirit of restlessness or anything that would keep her from um, being still and hearing your whisper, hearing your voice. We just lift up her ministry, her business, her family, and we do pray your blessing on her, God. We pray for open doors. We pray that your word would go out through her in, in ways that will not return empty that you would just equip her during this time of waiting and resting in ways she never expected or imagined. And we just look forward to that time when, when some of the fruit of this time of pruning and stripping is going to come. And we just trust that that is going to come in ways that, that will just totally blow her mind. Lord, we just thank you for this time. We pray for anyone out there right now who is struggling who feels paralyzed and stuck, that you would allow your word to infuse them with life, with strength to to just walk, just that one step to get out of that that muck and mire 
that they would be able to stand on the solid rock of your word and find victory and abundance and fulfilled life. In Jesus' name, amen.